Uh, today, we are in the second message of a series called The Lemons of Life. The Lemons of Life. And uh, I want to real quick, if you're in fourth or fifth grade, would you raise your hands for me? Let me see, fourth or fifth grade? All right, now we need your help um, after church or next Wednesday night. Um, if you're in fourth or fifth grade, not third grade, fourth or fifth, I want you to see Miss Taylor. The next couple of Wednesday nights, I mean the next couple of Sundays, we're going to have a little lemonade stand set up in the coffee shop, okay? And we're going to want you all to help serve lemonade to anybody that wants it the next couple of Sunday mornings before church, okay? So just fourth and fifth grade. Um, so uh, we're, we're excited for you guys to be able to help us do that. It's free. We're not charging for the lemonade. It's just for you guys to kind of get involved and help out, okay? So talk to Ms. Taylor Wednesday night during your groups, okay, about uh, what you can do, fourth and fifth grade, all right? Um, turn with me in your Bibles. We read a little bit of this last week. Uh, we're going to be going through two or three, four different passages this week. Um, I'm not always an expository preacher. In fact, most of the time you guys know I am not an expository preacher, but I am an expository studier. So there is a difference between being an expository studier and an expository preacher. If you don't have a clue what I just said, just move on right past what I just said, okay? Um, so uh, real quick, I thought as we get ready to get into the Word, I would share three or four or five dad Bible jokes Dad Bible jokes. Number one, what did Jonah's family say when he told them about what happened before uh, reaching Nineveh? Hmm, smells fishy. Let's see. Which Bible character was super fit? Absalom. Okay, all right. Thank you for the appreciation. I'll see my middle son after church. Uh, what did Adam say when he, uh, when he was asked what his favorite holiday was? Christmas Eve, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll just share a couple more, and I'm moving on. All right, what do you call a Bible character who just pulled into church? A parking lot. Okay. What did God's people say when food from heaven? Oh, man. Nah. Ah, pretty good. <clears throat> Some of y'all are like, I'm never going back to that church again. <laughs> okay, last one, I promise. What did pirates call Noah's boat? The ark. Okay. <clears throat> All right. See, thank you, Michael. I appreciate it, brother. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> um, today, we're in the second uh, message of this series called The Lemons of Life. When life hands you lemons, you do what? You make lemonade. You make lim not hot chocolate. Who said you make hot chocolate? <laughs> what? You make lemonade. When life hands you lemons, how many of you guys have ever been handed lemons before in life? You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. Today we're going to talk about the lemon of disappointment. The dis of disappointment. How many of you guys have ever been disappointed before? Really disappointed. You, you know what I'm talking about. Today we're going to talk about handling disappointment. Walking through a time in your life when you are disappointed. The scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, and we begin today, I want to read the scripture together. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Now, we read this last week, and I want to read it one more time. For this light momentary affliction, everybody say light momentary affliction. Man, that's a mouthful. Is preparing for us... The contrast, an eternal weight, pressure. We talked about two weeks ago when life hands you pressure. The light momentary affliction you are dealing with is preparing for you an eternal pressure 
weight of glory. Why? Because God's glory is so much more pressure than anything we deal with in this life. And if we cannot deal with the life, momentary affliction of this life, we will not stand under the glory of God for eternity. That's why we face it now. This light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Keep going, Eli, if you can, for just a moment. We have one more? As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So we walk through disappointment. And there are a few reasons why we get disappointed in life. The first, people will not always meet our expectations. You have an expectation in someone, and they let you down. And don't look to your neighbor, don't look to your spouse, y'all. But have you ever been disappointed by someone? Someone that did not meet your expectations. I once heard somebody, Kenneth, you'll appreciate this for marriage class or marriage ministry, I know. I once heard about the bride. She's walking down the aisle. She sees the aisle. She sees the altar. She sees him, and she thinks, I'll alter him. See? Doesn't work that way, does it? Expectations. Number two, we're disappointed because circumstances will not always meet our expectations. I thought I would be in a better place than I am, but circumstances out of my control are not what I expected. And number three, I will not always meet my expectations. Sometimes the one that lets myself down more than anybody is me. Number four, God doesn't always meet my expectations. You guys remember the story of Joseph in the Bible? Joseph, in, in the latter part of the book of Genesis, he was, he was uh, betrayed by his brothers. He was his dad's favorite. His dad made him a coat of many colors. And he was betrayed. His brothers threw it, sold him into slavery. And he was, he, was, uh, he was purchased by a man named Potiphar. You guys remember that story? And Potiphar's wife wrongfully accused him of something bad. And, and then he was thrown into prison. And in prison, he, he uh, met a baker and a butler. And, and, was it the, and he had two dreams, one about each one of them. And wasn't it the, the, uh, the butler that, that uh, was released out of prison, went back to Pharaoh's house, and, and finally remembered him after all this time? The baker was hung. He was like, I got a good dream about one of you. I got a bad dream about one of you is going to get hung. One of you is going to be promoted. Now, I would hope my 50-50 chance landed on the one to be promoted. And so... Joseph, long story short, he's remembered because he can interpret dreams. And he gets out of prison, meets with Pharaoh, interprets a crazy dream for Pharaoh about a famine in the land, is promoted to see the, uh, the release of, of food in the land of Egypt. I'm condensing this. And at the end of this story, guess who shows up to get food in the land of Egypt? His brothers. And here Joseph, yeah, you guys are smart. His, his, his brothers meet him face to face. And at first they don't even recognize him. And he runs out weeping bitterly. And he comes back in and he faces them. And he says something profound in Genesis chapter 50. He says this in verse 20. As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for what? For good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph could have looked at disappointment after disappointment after disappointment in his life, but he didn't. He said, what you meant for evil, God intended for good. How could there be two different purposes or intent for one situation who, ulti who ultimately controlled the outcome? You see, we live in a progressive of time. Now, I'm going to say something a little philosophical with this, and then we're going to move right on past it. Study this out for yourself. It's just food for thumb. We're going to move on. We live in a progressive of time. From the book of Genesis on, 
God created day and night, and he, 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 he created time. But did you know that God defies and lives outside of time and energy and space and matter? He owns it all, and he exists outside of time. We live in this progression of time, but God exists outside of our dimension of time. We measure life by outcome based on previous intent, but God exceeds past, present, and future simultaneously. This is what was crazy about the cross, is when Jesus died on the cross, he purchased the price for the sins, past, present, and future in one simultaneous event. How could he do that? How could he pay for something that hadn't even transpired yet? It wasn't just he threw them in a deposit account knowing we would sin. No, he wiped them away. How did he wipe away something that hadn't existed? Because he defies our time limitations. He lives outside of it. So did what happened to jo Joseph happen as a choice from his brothers or his responses or God's sovereignty and power? And the truth is all three. The valley that you and I walk through, our free, real, our free will is real, the valley is real, but as we experience the timeline of the valley, God is already present in your future. Think about that. God's already there. He's already with you where you're going to be. That's his sovereignty. It's what he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 19 through 21. Let's read them quickly, and I'm moving. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was what? Made manifest in the last times for the sake of himself? No. For the sake of me and you who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in our circumstances, are in the things that we were disappointed in, are in people, are in ourselves. No, so that our faith and hope are in God and God alone. There's a song that some friends of mine wrote for Jason Crabb. And the song says this, you can get bitter from the flames or you can get hurt. You can get worn out and lost because you got burned. But when you see the hand of God raised through the fire, he can raise you from the ashes and make you new again. I've lived and I've lost the ones I've loved. I've looked to the sky and asked God, why was my faith not enough? But then I saw the hand of God reaching through the fire. He pulled me from the ashes, and he made me new again. The chorus says, forge me in the flames. Bend my desires. I yield my will. Refine me in the fire. Whatever it takes to take me higher, you've never forsaken me. You stay through the heat. You're a friend in the fire. There's a story in the book of Daniel. We all know it. Daniel and three, brother, three, three, uh, three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were taken from their homes, everything they knew, the culture they had experienced, and they were brought to Nebuchadnezzar and indoctrinated, and they were attempted to feed them food, and Daniel said, no, give us a season without having to eat your food and participate in your stuff and see if we're not healthier and more vibrant and we don't look better. And in everything, they answered more wise than any of the others. They didn't sit in disappointment. You see... Faith is the expectation to encounter God's promises through our timeline, through our timeline. Because although he supersedes our timeline, 
Faith is saying, God, I want to encounter promises right now, right where I'm at. I want to know what do you have for me. And I'm going to believe no matter what it looks like, Lord. I will not live in disappointment, but I'm going to keep my eyes focused on you and you alone. Reasons, though, that we don't either have the faith or we've not experienced yet. Now, I want you to listen, church, because this is one of the biggest blocks to most of us as believers. And young people, I want you to listen. Reasons why we either don't have faith or we aren't experienced something yet. Number one, now, it's not all of them. It could be one of them. You have to discern in yourself what it is. The first is we can be nearsighted. We can only see this one little piece when God sees the rest. And if we're capable, we can step back and see a little bit more. Sometimes we are, sometimes we're not. Sometimes it's a limitation based on our flesh and who we are. But nearsightedness will cause roadblocks in our faith. Number two, we have misplaced desires. Some of us are simply, not all of us, not every situation, but there are some times we're wanting things that just aren't, it's just not right. God, make me this, make me that, do this for me, do that for me. And he knows it's not right. Misplaced desires. Number three, one of the reasons why, and I think so much of the time, is that God has something better. God has something better. We may not realize it yet. We may not see it yet. We may not know it yet. It may just be right around the corner. But whatever we're facing in our life that's causing this disappointment, this misplaced expectation in our life, God has something better. And if you believe the word, you know Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good. For those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Do you believe that scripture? Church, do you believe it? All things work together for good. So, in these moments of difficulty in our life, of these struggles, when we're facing the fire or we're in the midst of the fire and we don't understand, we can get sour, we can get sassy, some of us get salty, or we can get sold out. We can get sold out. Which one are you? Which one have you become? You see... I don't want to let the things in my life get me sour or sassy or salty. I want the things that have happened in my life to push me to be sold out like never before. Because some of y'all know I'm talking about you've been through it. And the temptation is there to get, to get sour, to get bitter. But when you allow your pain to turn to purpose, look out, church. You see, Moses led the nation of Israel. Joseph served a crisis in famine. Ruth embraced a new heritage. Paul led the church. And we just reminded ourselves a couple of weeks ago in Philippians chapter 3, when we feel this pressure and when we feel these disappointments to press in into his presence, to press out as we resist the world and to press on into the future. And that's what he said in Philippians chapter 3. Not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who are mature think this way, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Press in, press out, press on. I, this weekend, 
I went with Carly. She, most of you guys know she plays travel basketball, and we were playing in an AAU tournament in Dallas, Texas this weekend. And I'm telling you guys, this is different down there. We had to walk through metal detectors to play basketball. I'm being real, okay? And after a couple games of it getting handed to us, the coach pulls us outside the gym, and he said this. He said, listen, and he got a little, he raised his voice. Can you guys believe that? It's just so offensive when people raise their voice. He raised his voice, and he said this. We don't get pushed around. We do the pushing. Some of y'all didn't like hearing that, did you? Did you know, Christians, it's time we quit getting pushed around and we started doing the pushing? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but it's time that we got on our knees and we started doing the pushing. But we live in an American church culture of weak Christians. Man, we get offended at so many stupid little things. We get our feelings hurt over the littlest things. Well, did you know what sister said about me? And what'd you say about her? Man, I'm telling you guys, Jesus ain't come back for some feeble, weak little church. We better be strong, and we better know how to fight and fight on our knees. He's coming back for a church that he died for, that he paid everything for. And God help us if we're not strong enough. God help us if we're not evangelizing. God help us if we're not living it out. How do I live in disappointments? How do I live with them? Because they come. If I told you today you can live life without being disappointed, I would be lying. <clears throat> because you're going to be disappointed. How do we live? You put them in the God closet. Now, I'm going to say this today, and some of y'all are like, well, that's not what my therapist said. Well, okay. Every one of us in our life, we have this house. It's called our life. And we have rooms in our house. We have a living room. We have a bedroom. We have, we have a bathroom. Okay. We also have what's called a God closet. And some of us need to take our stuff that we're living with, and we need to put it in the God closet and shut the door. And we need to quit living every day as a victim. We need to quit declaring it over ourselves and talking about it. Some of you all know, sometimes it helps, most of the time it doesn't. You say, what, what are you saying, Brandon? You're saying live in denial? No. I'm saying let God deal with it. Give it to God and put it in the God closet and shut the door. Let me spiritualize it for you. Put it under the blood of Jesus. Put it under the blood. Plead the blood of Jesus. Some of you all, you're still living in past broken relationships and past hurts and unforgiveness and struggles, and you don't know why your whole house is a wreck. It's because you've got your dirty laundry living everywhere. Put it in the God closet. We all know what that's like. Hey, guys, we got company coming over in an hour, and what do we all do? Now, y'all think I'm talking about hiding stuff. I'm not. But did you know God can take care of it in a moment's time with the blood of Jesus? Why do I say put it in the God closet and not just pretend? Because the truth is, there are things in our life that really won't ever go away. If you've experienced a crisis in your life, a betrayal in your life, a disappointment in your life, there's no way that I can stand up here and tell you that it's going to go completely away. It will not. It's going to be there. But it can be in the God closet. And you can know, yes, it's part of my life. Yes, it's part of my journey. Yes, it's there. But it doesn't have to be in the living room. It doesn't have to be in the bedroom. Some of y'all needed to hear that. 
It can be in the God closet. Under the blood of Jesus. Sometimes life tries to open that door back up. Sometimes I open that door back up. Maybe for a moment. Maybe it's memories. Maybe it's thoughts. Maybe it's fears. It's okay for a moment. Put it back in the God closet. Put it back under the blood. Leave it under the blood. Revelation 10 through 11, or uh, 12, 10 through 11. It says this, For I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers, the one that most likely opens that door and tries to spread all our laundry all over the house again. The accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Now, let's look at this next verse. And they have overcome him. Everyone say, I can overcome. Oh, say it like we believe it, church. I can overcome. And they have conquered him by what? The God closet, the blood of Jesus. And the what? Word of their testimony. Church, you can overcome. There is an accuser. But the, but the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, there is an advocate. There is an accuser, but there is an advocate. Can we read that verse, brother? Just keep going with me. I got to move fast. It's about lunchtime. My little children, I am writing these things to you so you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, if anybody does have anything that's got to be put in that closet, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation, the substitution for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of who? The whole world. The whole world. You see, victory doesn't come by trying to pretend or to cope or move forward. Victory comes when things are put in the God closet, when our stuff is placed under the blood of Jesus, we receive victory. I'm so excited my grandparents are here today. Pop says this is the first time he's ever heard me preach. My grandparents that raised me are here today. And outside my grandma where her sink is and her dishes, where she does the dishes, or where she tells pops to do the dishes, down through the valley behind their house, inside where she can see it out the window of the kitchen. And on that sign is white with, I think it's red letters. Posted on a tree on the other side of the valley is just the words, victory. Because you and I can live in victory. When our stuff is put under the blood of Jesus. I'm almost done. Hebrews chapter 9. You guys know this, but there's three things. Oh, man, oh, man. My last verse. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Three things I want to point out that need, that we can have in the God closet as we face disappointments in our life. Number one, when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things, and by the way, side note, after we get done with the front porch stories and we hear all the testimonies this summer, Stephen and Cindy, we're going to do a full teaching series beginning the end of August, 1st of September on the tabernacle. I'm so excited. But each week we're going to talk, we're going to teach on the tabernacle. I'm looking for, oh man, okay, move on. When Christ appeared as the high priest of the good things that have come, which through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is not of this creation, he entered once and for all into the holy place, not by means of the blood of goats or calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered for himself, now watch this, without blemish to God, purify our what? Y'all reading this with me? Purify our <coughs> conscience 
from dead works to serve the living God. The first thing that can go into the glog closet under the blood of Jesus is our conscience. Because it's the first thing that gets tested when we do something. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from, number two, the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Scripture says in Isaiah, he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So our conscience, our transgressions, the things we've done, and finally the next verse, for where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. The third part of this, of who we are, that must be put under the blood of Jesus is our desires, that he would sanctify our desires, our will. How many of y'all know it's a whole lot easier to be on a diet when you want to be on the diet? It's hard when you don't want to be. Trust me, I'm, I drive by Shakey's every day, and my steering wheel just gravitates towards it. Ooh. Our will, our desires. Skip on down for the, first, for the second time, verse 24. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Disappointments. Man, some of us just, we have to give them to Jesus, y'all. Yeah. Give them to Jesus. Let him place them under his blood. I want to do something kind of different today. We're not going to end on a low note. We're going to end on a high note. Because I feel like if we've been disappointed, the last thing we need to do is just be sad in here about it. You know what I'm saying? So you guys stand with me this morning. Bow your heads for just a moment. Before we do this, I, I do want us just to be honest this morning and ask. And just bow your heads with me for just a moment. And we're going to move fast through this. I, I think we're going to. Okay. As your heads are bowed and eyes are closed, you say, Brandon, you are preaching to me. More importantly, the Holy Spirit is preaching to you, not me. But if that's you today, and you say, Brandon, I have really been walking through a place of disappointment in my life, and I want healing today. There's some things I want to put in the God closet. I want to place under the blood of Jesus, and I want to do it today. Would you just raise your hand for me? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands all over this place. I'm not going to ask you to come forward today, but I am going to ask. We're going to sing this old gospel hymn together, and we're going to do it a cappella church style. I'm going to pray for you, and then we're going to sing this song. And as we sing this song, I want you to declare these words over yourself as we give this to God. Let me pray, and then we're going to sing this old song together. Lord, I want to thank you. As we've walked through this life with disappointments in our life, whether it be someone or something, or whether it be ourself, or whether it be, Lord, that we thought you were going to do this, and you didn't do it our way. And so we're walking through hurt and trials. You're blessed enough. And today, you have victory for us. Lord, I pray today that we would just give it to you. Lord, we don't have to live in it. We don't have to live in disappointment. There are going to be moments but, Lord, we can give it to you, and you can put it in the God closet. And, yes, there will be scars. There will be struggles. There will be moments where that door kind of opens. But, Lord, we thank you for the blood that covers. Thank you, Lord, that every time we walk through the valley, you prove yourself faithful over and over again. Lord, today we want to walk out of here in victory, knowing that you love us. So, Lord, today we receive your victory. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.